Legacy Maker, the All one, Sports one, Network. One, 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 one. Welcome to the one on one. One on one. When, when it comes to ratings, man, we number one. We number one. I get the truth, truth. Then I give them the scoop. Hey. If anybody got a question, I give them the proof. Hey. Hey. Welcome to the one on one. one on one. When it comes to ratings, man, we number one. We number one. I get the truth, truth. Then I give them the scoop. Hey. If anybody got a question, I give them hey. the proof. Hey. Hey. Welcome to one on one at Legacy Maker Sports Network. Hello, everybody. Darrell Lawrence, Legacy Maker Sports Network, and we are here for another edition of One on One on the Legacy Maker Sports Network. This is episode 35, and with me today, I have one of the best in the game with me. He is the host of the Fer Freddie and Fitz Simmons show on XM Series Radio, uh, channel 80, that's 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Monday through Friday. If you want a great take on sports, you got to hit up my man, Mr. Freddie Coleman. Freddie, how you doing, brother? I'm good, Darrell, but why did it take episode 35 for me to be invited? That's you know what, what I you know what, Freddie? You know, I <laughs> that's something I gotta work on. You know, I, I said, you know what, I gotta get Freddie in there, man. You know, but I don't know, 35 <laughs> just feels like a good number for you, Freddie. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just busting your chops, but I'm really honored to be here, my friend, and, and looking forward to having some fun today. Awesome, awesome. Well, you know, here on a one-on-ones, we always start off with the check-in. And so I want to check in on you and your family. Obviously, things have been crazy the last year. And I just want to check yeah. and see how your family doing, how life's treating you, and how things are going. Oh, it's definitely been tough. There's no doubt about that, Darrell, because no matter what people try to say about COVID-19, it's going to affect each and every one of us, whether it's directly or indirectly. But my family is safe and the vaccination continues to be rolled out there by our government doing a great job with that. And even ESPN has become a vaccination center for not just ESPN employees, but anybody in the state of Connecticut that is in that realm, whatever age group you're going to be in. So I've already signed up and they're going to give me my date to make sure I can go and stick out my right arm and have them do what they have to do this way. <laughs> yeah, I know this way I can be safe and everybody around me can't be safe, but I appreciate you asking. Everybody's doing well. That's a, that's a good deal. I mean, you know, it's been a very crazy time. And I know I always tell people about this, but you, hey, you got to be out there. You got to be safe. You got to mask up. You know, uh, people pass away every day. I lost my mom to it. Yeah. I lost my grandpa. He had it. So people don't really realize how important it is to just, you know, really monitor yourself out there and think about other people while you're out there. Yeah, I think a big part of the Darrell is that a lot of people have this Superman mentality that nothing bad is going to happen to me, or if it affects me, I'm going to be able to deal with it. This has been an unknown monster that a lot of people took lightly at the beginning, because how many times do we hear either from the average Joe and Josephine or people in the know outside of the scientists and medical experts that this was a junior varsity version of the flu and everybody right. making too much out of it. We've <laughs> lost close to 550,000 people. Right. Ever since it really had the outbreak and the pandemic first got started. So you can't just slide it away and say, well, that happened to them. That's not going to happen to me. It may not happen to you, but who's to say that you didn't carry it to somebody else and it wound up affecting them, even though you were asymptomatic. So I hope that people for the ones that don't have not gotten the message, the other ones that have gotten the message are going to be a lot more where they're going to make sure that if you're not worried about protecting me, but I'm going to be worried about protecting me. And then you have to go along and keep your fingers crossed and keep your prayers up. Well, and it's crazy because, you know, you said junior varsity verse. I'm thinking this is more like the all pro, all American version yeah. that we've gotten out of this, man. So it's 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 good to see. I think some people are being a lot more conscious on it. I, I, you know, I do think the sports in general have done the best that they can under the circumstances. You know, we applaud the NBA over the summertime and what they did with the bubble. I thought that was phenomenal. Uh, you know, NHL got to give them love where they what credit is due. They did a great job up there. And I think that you know, uh, even a lot of the college teams, because they really had to go through like, oh, well, you know, on the fly canceling games. And they have done a really good job, I think, on, for the most part of trying to balance giving these kids uh, and these uh, young adults a, a, a season or, you know, giving them something, especially for those seniors out there. Well, Terrell, I hope people realize that the sports landscape has been forever changed, whether it's high school, whether it's college or whether it's pro, because from now on, safety is really going to be at a maximum. You can't just say, okay, when this slows down, when it's finally over, we're going to go back to where we were because I go back to reading about the Spanish flu 
that happened in the early 20th century. And it took about two or three years before some sort of normalcy was able to happen. Then that led to the roaring 20s and everybody was dancing and drinking and carrying on. But it didn't happen right away once the right. Spanish flu was finally eradicated or at least slowed down to the point that you believe you could go out and be as normal as you possibly could. So I hope people realize, even though their technology, of course, is far better in the 21st century than compared to the 20th century, that doesn't mean that the instant that more and more things are opened up or we have more and more liberal restrictions, that you can just go back to where you were. And I hope right. many people in sports will realize that because more than ever before, you just don't know where this is going to hit or who it's going to hit and how many people it can affect. So you can do everything right. You can have as many testing and many protocols as possible, but then a Gino Oriem of UConn, he's going to get hit. Or six referees that are part of the NCAA tournament, they had to be sent home because somebody got affected and then contact tracing, and you got to deal with that. So I hope that people, whether you love sports, Darrell, or don't love sports, realize it's not just going to be a snap your fingers mentality and go back to the way things were especially in sports, this landscape has been forever changed, whether it comes to safety and especially when it comes to the money line in sports. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, we will get back to, you know, get close to that normalcy. And like you said, it's probably going to take a couple of years. And I think a lot of people don't, you know, think, oh, man, you know, Texas is starting to open up and some places like that. And all right. So I, I think some people are going to really start to realize, you know, we're, we're taking our time. We're going to we're going to get there if we work yeah. well together. Yeah. And you got to respect people's personal space. You may not agree with what they're doing, but that does not give you the license and the right to say, well, you you can't do this. Well, who's to say that you're supposed to be doing that as well? Right. And I've seen way too many instances of that with businesses opening up and they want to tell people to put a mask on. And you had the woman in the bank in Texas not too long ago that wanted to withdraw her money out of the bank, but everybody in the bank had a mask on. She didn't have a mask on. The police were called and she was refusing, saying this was against her rights. And the people in the bank were like, uh, uh, uh. We understand that you don't want your money in the bank because you have to wear a mask. You don't want to do that. That's fine. But you right. got to follow the rules. People, It seems that people made the real. They always try to talk about inhibiting on their rights. And I say, do you have a job? And right. most of the time people say, yes. When you go to work, you got to follow protocols and you got to follow policy. Right. Or right. you're not going right. to have a job. And they go, exactly. Said, so what's the difference? When you go into a store, whether it's a restaurant or a department store, if they say no mask, no service, then if you're going to go in there, you got to put your mask on. If you don't want to do that, then find another place that you believe it's going to suit you. I don't understand this whole don't push me around mentality. If you don't own a business, when you go to your job, you're going to be told what to do. When you're married, you're going to be told what to exactly. do. You got to follow yeah. the rules of the law. <laughs> uh, I've been married for 15 years. I'm going to let me tell you something. I know the laws and the regulations. If my right. wife said this, you got to do it and just keep rolling. I, I like. I'm not trying to be in the doghouse, man. I got. I, I got right. things to do. You know. Well, people, I think they, they talk about. Well, you know, if that happens. I'll be prepared for it. People always say that when they believe Darrell, they don't have anything to lose. But then you really get to the truth of the matter, and all of a sudden. You got you got the, the bracelets on and then you realize, OK, this is real. I didn't think I was going to go to jail. You got to have every possible scenario that's going to be in your head that if you decide not to follow the rules. If you decide not to go what medical and the scientists are telling you about COVID-19, then don't be surprised. Let's say if you contract COVID-19 or you pass on to somebody else and it affects your body for the rest of your life, even if you're able to find a way to overcome it and get past it. I think I think too many people don't want to think about what could possibly happen. They have that Superman mentality to say, well, even if it happens to me, I'm going to find a way to be better, overcome it. And I think too much of that has gone on inside and outside of sports. Well, hopefully as a whole, as a country, we can finally get this thing under control. We see other countries doing it. I know we can do it too. I know we're a little bit bigger, but I know we can do it too. No doubt about that. Now, Freddie, let's, let's swing to that time in your life. I want to know that time in your life when you were little Freddie, you said, you know what, man, where did my passion of sports come from? When was that moment when you knew, man, sports was going to be your all in all and that you had fell in love with sports? Boy, that's a good question. I don't know if there was ever what I like to call a me cleaver moment where before that came along and after, after that you were a different person. I guess it just happened organically, Darrell, because I remember watching football games as a kid, watching basketball games as a kid, watching baseball games with my parents, with my other relatives. So there wasn't that one moment that I said, okay, that's where my passion 
for sports really happened because I was very blessed to be in a household where my mom and dad, they love sports. My dad hated the Dallas Cowboys. My mom <laughs> loved the Dallas Cowboys. Everybody was a New York Knicks fan. Everybody was a New York Mets fan. I became a hockey fan. My mom and dad, and I, we don't want any part of that, but I became a New York Knicks <laughs> fan from that standpoint. So there wasn't really one particular moment where I said to myself, yeah, that's where the passion is going or where it developed or where it got started. It was never anything from that one particular position or one, one particular moment where I said to myself, okay, I can go back to that. And that's where that became like a neon moment from that standpoint. It just was always a fabric of my family when we got together for holidays and people watching football games on the TV or if there's a big basketball game on my dad would watch with his friends at our house and they would come over and hang out and yelling and screaming at the TV screen. It always was something that was around me from that standpoint. Although I will say this, I'll never forget the first game that I had ever gone to. And it was one of the first memories I ever had of any kind of sport. When Grambling took on Morgan State in football and used to play that game each and every year at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, New York. And I'll never forget being about four years of age, but this was 1970. And I'm going into the stadium and my dad's got me on his shoulders and we get into the stadium. And Darrell, I had never seen that many black people in one place like that <laughs> in my life. I a lot of folks. Oh my God, I could not believe it. I, I thought, because when you're a kid, your realm, your world is really not outside of who you see or your household, anything like that. So I thought that we were the only fans that love Grambling football or Morgan State or Black College football. Right. And then to go there and hear the bands, I'll never forget that was such a vivid memory for me at four and a half years of age back in September, back in 1970. And I could not believe that that many people were there to watch a football game. So the first sporting event is always something that I say to myself, I'm glad I had that as a memory, even though my dad's I was knocked out maybe through the second quarter. I was out cold. The next thing I remember <laughs> was sleep, up sleep. Home. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. The minute that I got comfortable sitting on my mom's lap, it was night-night for Freddie from that standpoint. That's but funny. That's it was the funny. initial part that was burned in my memory, and that was something I never, ever forgot. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, man. I, and it's crazy because I remember, like, you know, growing up around here and – you know, like my parents weren't big into sports. And my mom used to say, well, Darrell, why do you watch, you know, like you watch sports in the morning? I said, because I, I have to know it all. You know, yep. I, have, I have to, you know, when I'm at school and people are like, why do you, how did you know that? Oh, don't worry about it. Why are you watching the draft from beginning to end? Why are you watching it to the sixth round when nobody else is paying attention? I'm like, well, because I love it. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just my, it's my passion for, you know, and then playing that, you know, when I was younger was just like, Oh, man, you know, I, I didn't have my really big moment except for we played at college. I think we had a college. We played at Hampton Sydney College in uh, mm -hmm. Farmville, Virginia. We uh, played in a um, in our district tournament. That was the biggest crowd I ever had been in, involved in any type of sport. Man, I was so nervous, man. I still get chills thinking about how crazy that game was. We won. So I was right. cool with that, but it was crazy times. I, I tell you what, the one thing I'm always jealous of your generation is the fact that you have so many means to watch sports and to digest sports because growing up and I was born in 1965 and growing up in the seventies, mm -hmm. you didn't know anything about sports unless you watched the team that was on TV that they had the local broadcast, but you didn't see home games because they were blacked out. You only right. saw the old guys playing the road. If you were a Knicks fan or whatever, and major league baseball team, you could see them at home. It was just a different animal. Same thing with the national football league, but in terms of sports scores and digesting sports scores, if there was a big football game, but you didn't catch it on that Sunday, you had to wait until the 11 o'clock news to Man. find out who won a four o'clock game. Ooh. And I'll never forget that Channel 5 in New York, they started a 7.30 Sunday sports cast. And I said, oh, thank God, I can find out to wait till 11 o'clock to find out who won. <laughs> Please give me something. <laughs> exactly. Because and when, when the Giants and Jets, that's what you're going to get in the market growing up in New York like I did. And in the 70s, both of those teams are just horror awful from that standpoint. So right. I, I was just dying to see anybody else. That's why Monday Night Football became so big to me, because they always have primetime matchups. You got to see the Raiders, the Dolphins, the Cowboys. You got to see teams that were actually good other than the New York Giants and the New York Jets. So for the longest time in the 70s, if there was a big game, the Giants and Jets already played maybe in that afternoon. You didn't see that game unless it was Thanksgiving Day. So I envy this generation that no matter where a game is, there's so many resources and avenues that you can find that game, whether it's on TV or streaming, on your phone, on your tablet, whatever that is. Right. If I had had that, Darrell, when I was growing up. You'd have been set. You'd have been oh, set. I'd have, I'd have flunked out of school from that standpoint. There's no doubt about that. There's no way in heck that somebody would have been able to make that work for me from that standpoint. Exactly. No exactly. That. Exactly. Now, uh oh, damn it. 
Hey. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's my phone going off from that standpoint. Sorry about it's that. A, no, you're, you're good. You're good. Look, look, we at the mercy of technology from time to time. You already know how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let, well, let's talk a little bit about your, your college career. You know, you, you know, you go to Mansfield College, you have a career there in, in football. Um, you know, tell us about that journey through that. But how did that turn into a career in journalism? Well, I mean, I have to worry about phones interrupting us in football practice. So that's one thing <laughs> from that standpoint. And there are, I never thought I was going to play college football. It was always a dream of mine because when you watch Saturday afternoon games like I did and you see Alabama versus Auburn, Texas versus Oklahoma, USC versus Notre Dame, right. you got a chance to see that. I'm thinking, man, I'd give anything to even be a part of something like that. But I never thought about that because my high school didn't have a football team. And the only time I played tackle football growing up was Pop Warner football. And as everybody knows, they have a weight limit. So when I got the brochure from Manchester University, I'm thinking that looks like a pretty good school. Right. Then I get to the back of the brochure and I see they have a football team. I'm thinking, oh, that could be my avenue. That could be where I could get a chance to play college football. And people don't realize how tough it is to play college football. I don't care if it's Division One. Division two, division three, NAIA, junior college, whatever. Right. It is hard work to do that. That is, in essence, a part time job that you're not getting paid for, especially in division two. So, when I first got to Mansfield, the coach that was there the first year I was there, I wanted to walk on because I knew I was not going to be a scholarship player. Right. And he didn't want to bother with walk ons. That was just something that was completely foreign to him. He figured that he didn't invest in you. So, why would he have you on your football team? <laughs> but he wound up getting blown out. And Tom Elsasser became the head coach. He's become a second father to me. I still keep mm -hmm. in contact with him to this day. He is somebody that I always follow the precepts that he was able to put out there with our football team in terms of outside of football. And I remember going to his office. He said, I don't care if you're a walk-on and out of walk-on. If you can play, you I'm going to put you on that field. <laughs> so I never will ever forget that he gave me an opportunity to prove myself. And that's how that all happened. Start off on the JV squad getting my brains beat and doing practice and everything like that. But I kept learning the game. And the more and more I learned, the better I got. And the better that I got, he was able to help me and all the coaches even more. So I never thought in a million years, they're all, that I'd be playing college football and then have a chance to be a starter on the college football team. I tell people all the time, college football, football teaches such great life lessons. It teaches you to never give up. It teaches how to work well with others. A guy may be kicking your butt. How can you figure out how to kick his butt from that standpoint? There's so many great life lessons that you can learn playing college football, even playing football, period. Man, it's crazy, right? I mean, I mean, I, I always dreamed of it. I always told myself if I was six, seven, mm -hmm. I might have been able to get in there. I mean, I was six, one going up against guys, six, eight. I knew I didn't stand a chance to make college ball unless unless I got lucky in baseball. But, you know, I started baseball late. I could I just I just could never, you know, get to that. I've always wanted to. But, you know, I was like, that's all right, though. I'm going to knock it out in the sports world in, in some form of the fashion. So, yeah. but, you know, and, and speaking of that, you know, obviously you got your, your sports journalism career and then you you find yourself at ESPN. And, and you know, uh, you know, can you tell us how that journey um, kind of happened for you? Well, I, well, one of the great things about going to Mansfield University in Pennsylvania, we have a tremendous communications department where you work doing stuff on the TV side where we had our own TV studio. But we also had our on-campus radio station that served everybody in the surrounding area. So that was a great training and proving ground to really get into radio because when I'm growing up in New York City, Radio DJs were superstars. There wasn't sports talk radio right. when I grew up. The only sports talk radio host at that time was Art Rush Jr. And that happened to come about when WABC 770 AM went from music to talk radio. And he did a sports talk show each and every night from 7 to midnight. People don't talk enough about him, Darrell, in terms of being a pioneer. And not right. just for sports talk radio, but for Black people in radio. Because he was somebody who was of color. And he was so sharp. He was so witty. He was great with callers. He was great with information. He was somebody that I couldn't wait to listen to each and every night, in addition to the music radio DJs that I love to listen to. So having a chance to do that at Mansfield and being a part of that and understanding the broadcasting process, that radio bug bit me even more and more. But I never thought that I would be working in sports talk radio because there wasn't anything like that around until after I graduated from Mansfield in 1987. Then WFAN in New York became the first sports, all sports talk radio station with 24 hours, seven days a week. And I said, I'll never get, they had the promo on TV. I said, wait, let me get this straight. There's going to be something and people talk about sports <laughs> all the time and you don't have to beg, borrow, steal. 
where do I sign up for this? You know, and I could not get enough of WFAN morning, noon and night. I listened to them, but I never thought I would ever be at a place like that because I was so interested in doing music radio and enjoying that, being a program director, being a music director and everything like that. But right about the early 2000s, when I was still in the radio game a little bit, but I was doing more on the TV side. Mm-hmm. And my friend Rick Zolzer in the Hudson Valley, he did a sports talk show each and every day. And I had a chance to be a guest on his show because we've known each other for years. And there'll be plenty of times, Darrell, that I would be out covering an event with a camera on my shoulder for the news that night. And it got to a point that every Friday, every Monday, like, okay, where's Freddie today? And I'll say, yeah, I'm covering the soccer game between right. Ketchum and Arlington. And right now the soccer game is two to one. We'll be talking sports while I'm covering the game. And then also I had a chance to fill in for him, then fill in for other people. And then my friend John Tobin went up to Albany and he didn't want to do music radio anymore. He wanted to do a sports talk radio show and he wanted to do it with me. So the next thing you know, we had a tryout in 2003 for every weekend in August. Management liked what they heard. They gave us a chance to have our own show Monday through Friday starting in February. And I'll never forget, it was the Monday after the Patriots played the Panthers in that Super Bowl. So we had a chance to really kick off a show that way. In addition to the game, going down to the final whistle, the whole Janet Jackson, Justin Timberlake thing. We had so many things to talk about leading off our show. And then ESPN Radio, our general manager, Bruce Gilbert, heard me. And Jason Barry was a producer of Game Night. And Bruce Gilbert said, you know who he is. And Jason goes, know him. I have his phone number. Right. He got in touch with me. I went and audition, And almost 17 years later, here I am. That's amazing. That's amazing, man. See, and that's, I think people, you know, they don't, you know, look at it. I mean, you see, you know, man, it's supposed to be a smaller college and a lot of people don't see it. It's like, what, you know, can you make the leap from somewhere small and make it big? And you're one of those primary stories. And like, you know, you're, 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 you're a big name in the industry. When people see you, they, they know who you are and they know, they know what you do. You know, you got, you got a great reputation. I think your story can really show people that if you think that you can't do it, you can do it. I mean, you just have to keep pushing. Put it this way, Bill Gates, if he could become a multi-billionaire and he didn't graduate from, from college, right? The, you should not allow you to stop you. And I tell young people this all the time, that if you talk yourself out of something, you can't even imagine what you're missing out on. Right. Even if you don't get the position you're looking for, even if you don't get the job you're looking for, at least you put yourself, you put yourself in the ring. You get a chance to try to tame the bull. You get a chance to try to have the red cape to try to master the bull from that standpoint. But if you don't put yourself in the ring, you don't realize what you're capable of. And you don't realize that even if it doesn't work, you learn from that process and you get a chance to say the next time something opens up, I've been able to learn from that, even though it's a different situation. But now I have the expertise, at least being in the ring and what can work for me and what I should not do in those situations. So I tell people all the time, I was very blessed to have been taught extremely extremely well at Mansfield because they let us know here's who you're competing against you're competing against the Syracuses and the Dukes and the Northwesterns but that doesn't mean that you don't belong in that building right that doesn't mean you don't belong of not having a chance to prove yourself and show exactly what you've been able to learn and what you've been able to process and make that work so if I can go from little old Mansfield University population 2500 to the worldwide leader and I did not allow myself to get in the way of myself Mm -hmm then you shouldn't think that I can't accomplish that because of give yourself an opportunity, give yourself a chance to try it. And whatever happens, you can live with the result. The result especially you put yourself in that position to give 100% and you can deal with the result no matter what happens. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, and you're grinding. If you grind for those who are listening, there's nothing wrong with grinding, keep grinding. You can make it happen. And right. Yeah. Especially more than ever before. I think sometimes, and that's not trying to slight the younger generation because my right. generation did it as well. But I think sometimes the younger generation, they're looking for validation first. Life is never going to validate you. You have to validate yourself. No matter what you do or who you are around, you can't expect that life is going to give you the attaboy and the pat on the back. That's not what life does. Life will reward you if you think about rewarding yourself. And even if you don't find that reward in that instance, you can find it in a different way. And I want young people out there to realize that if you're expecting to start on top at the beginning, it may happen, but you got to realize you're an outlier. For everyone that has a chance to do that or are fortunate enough to be in that situation, there are thousands that have to start in a different place at a lower place. But right. that doesn't mean that their experience is going to be better than yours or that their position is going to be better than yours. It's okay to put yourself out there and trust in yourself and have faith in yourself. Because if you don't do that, then you're going to want to talk yourself out of a lot of great situations than grinding and putting yourself in the best situations when they come up. I couldn't have said it better. Couldn't have said it better. All right. Now we're going to head to 
My favorite segment of the show is time for quick ones. Freddie, are you ready for the Freddie Coleman edition of quick ones here on one on ones? I'm certainly ready. Probably the best. I'm certainly ready. Let's put it that way. All righty, all righty. So let's start it off with my favorite one to ask, and that is: Give me your favorite sports moment. My well, I think my favorite sports moment. I'll give you two. My favorite sports moment that I covered was when I was doing Maris basketball. The first year I did it versus Siena, they're playing their rival last game of the season. And Maris hadn't been good in the MAC until that third or fourth year. And Sean Kennedy hit a 45 foot shot at the buzzer for Maris to beat Siena. And the place went nuts. And I couldn't believe I was in the building when that happened. I had a chance to do a post game interview with all the guys that were part of that. So that's my favorite sports memory covering that. My favorite sports moment, I go back to Duke and Kentucky. To this day, that is the greatest game that I've ever watched. 1992 East Regional Championship. Kentucky on one side with Jamal Mashburn and all those guys. And Duke on the other side with Christian Layden, who did not miss a shot from perfect from the field or perfect from the free throw line. I still remember that game play by play as if it happened yesterday. So I still think that is my favorite sports moment. Having that happen, seeing one of the greatest games ever. Awesome, awesome. And I guess we got to switch to the next one. Worst sports moment. Worst sports moment, 1998 AFC Championship game, New York Jets versus the Denver Broncos. Oh, the Jets had not been to the Super Bowl, and they still haven't <laughs> been back there. They're kicking the you-know-what out of the Denver Broncos on the road, and Atlanta had beaten Minnesota with Randy Moss and Chris Carter and Randall Cunningham. So I'm thinking the Jets win this. There's no way the Atlanta Falcons are beating them in the Super Bowl. Right. 10 nothing lead in the third quarter. And then the first play, Elway throws a pass over Victor Jones's head to Ed McCaffrey, catches the pass. They go on to win the game. I have not forgotten about that. To me, that was worse than the Knicks losing game seven in 1994 to the Houston Rockets. Ooh. I think they're going to win that series anyway. Ooh. They had a 3-2 series lead. But that is the worst <laughs> sports moment for me, that the Jets were that close and they haven't been that close since like that. That's that's, that's crazy. I, I remember that. Man, that, that's crazy. I That was, uh you know, being a Packers fan, they had the loss – and lost to the Broncos the year before. So, you know, I was yep. coming off of a two, you know, two Super Bowl high at the time. And it was another, what, another 13 years before Aaron Incorporated got back. And now I'm Absolutely. sitting with another 10 game streak. But I can't complain. I mean, if you're a Jets fan, you've been through a lot more than I have on that end. <laughs> no doubt. Exactly. I don't know if they were going to get a Super Bowl in my lifetime. So I keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's real quick on this. Let's talk a little bit about the Jets. I mean, they've been making some moves so far in the free agent front, uh, bringing in. And, uh, Corey Davis. Uh, I think that's a really nice pickup. I think, you know, you know, he was a fifth pick a couple of years ago and he's done some, you know, last year, last couple of years, he's starting to really get into a stride. What do you thought of the, the Jets picks uh, pickups so far in free agency? Well, I like what they've been able to do, but this is all centered on what are they going to do with Sam Darnold? Because if you bring in a Corey Davis, I'm of, I'm of the firm belief, Darrell, that they're not bringing him in to catch passes from Sam Darnold unless they can't trade Sam Darnold. I firmly right. believe with eight teams, being in contact with the New York Jets. That's what Albert Breer from SI.com and MMQB reported. And he was not the only one reporting that. This is all the makers that the Jets are going to make a play for Deshaun Watson. Also heard another report that keep an eye on Russell Wilson, maybe going to the Jets because the Seattle may want Sam Darnold. Pete Carroll loves him from that standpoint. I know Robert Salah is going to bring the kind of coach that I think we've needed for more than a minute with the New York Jets. I think he can be a better version of Todd Bowles and Herm Edwards and also Bill Parcells. I think he has the ability to do that but they got to fix that quarterback. And if he believes that Sam Darnold is not his guy, you're not bringing in a Corey Davis to catch passes from him. You're bringing a Corey Davis to catch passes from two guys that you believe you can get, or right. you're going to draft a guy like Zach Wilson, the second pick in the draft when that happens in April. I, you know, I love the comparison to uh, Todd Bowles. I, I, a couple of years ago when we were covering um, Washington football team, Washington mm. football team uh, training camp. Uh, yeah. and, and at the time, you know, they were down for training camp. That's when the big fight between Terrell oh, yeah. Fryer and all that. I was right. I was like 10 feet away. And I remember him, you know, it was just a crazy mess. But I, I remember Coach uh, Bulls and I always thought that his demeanor and this is no slight towards him. I, I'm not saying that I don't think he'd be a great head coach, but I always felt like he's a no nonsense guy. And I don't think he was really about us. You know, it was he's just there for his right. football team. And I think uh, Robert Saleh is great because his personality is going to scream in the New York area, especially if he can get them to win, um, if he can get them on the winning track. So I love the comparison, especially on the defensive front. But I think he, you know, with his personality and being in yep. New York, you have to have, you kind of have to have both. I think he'll be great there. 
Yeah, and I think Todd Bowles got another opportunity because I think he learned so much from that first instance right. when it comes to what happened, what didn't happen to the New York Jets. And I firmly believe when that next opportunity rolls around, he's going to be a lot better coach having what he had to deal with personally and also professionally trying to make it work in that dark market with the Jets organization. Yeah, I think so, too. I think it's one of those things where he he, you know, definitely will learn from it. He's you know, he's got he's got the Super Bowl ring, you know, this year. You know, he's a little bit more uh, enhanced on what the what the thing I guess with the way the way the game is working now. I think that he has really he's going to get that other opportunity. I thought I thought Philadelphia was going to be the spot for a moment. But I I guess I guess, you know, next year, next year. <laughs> yeah, 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 probably better. He's not part of that, but Howie Roseman is the general manager more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want them, you don't want them problems. I mean, he, no, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Chip <laughs> Kelly. We, can, I don't even want to get into that. Now they got a ring out of it somehow, some way. But you know, right. it is what it is. Right. Uh, the the one interview that you've always wanted to give in live, you know, alive, you know, still alive, whatever. That one person that you always wanted to interview, or wish you could have interviewed. I would have loved to have interviewed in his prime Muhammad Ali because I guarantee you, I probably would have asked one question and then just sat back and let him do his thing <laughs> from that standpoint. Believe me, that's one interview that if I ever had a chance to talk to somebody, he would have been the guy that I would love to have talked to. That's number one. And honestly, on the other side, I would love to interview Althea Gibson because I think she's a uh, lost pioneer in sports geez. because she, she really kind of set the trend, not just for people of color in tennis. There's no Serena. There's no Venus. There's no Zena Garrison. There's no Shonda Rubin without Althea Gibson. But she also played a style that even John Macro said influenced him. It was serve and volley, get to the net, be aggressive. Mm-hmm. John Macro, people say, where you get your style from? He's always said, yeah, Big Bill Tilden was somebody that I followed, but he really loved the way Althea Gibson played along with Arthur Rash. He really kind of incorporated that into his style. And I saw a PBS documentary of her, and I said, man, I would love to have actually heard what she had to say about what she had to deal with getting to the top of her sport and still not getting recognized for being the best in her sport. Yeah. I'm not even going to sit here and lie to you. I I remember, you know, talking about her, learning about her growing up and, and I know, and I know that she was one of the best, but that you saying it just was like, man, how underrated, you know, was Althea Gibson, you know, like people, I, and and even me, I, and I'll sit here as a, you know, as a person and realize like she was very underrated, but she was so talented. Yeah. And I think that's crazy that, you know, you know, as we go further along in generations, how people forget how great she was. Yeah. I hate the fact that you have somebody out there, Gibson or Charlie Sifford, the first black man to win on the PGA tour. And he did that right about the same time that she was winning Wimbledon in the U S open. I hate the fact that they're lost to history because there's been this reemergence of learning more about our culture. And I think right. that's fantastic, but we shouldn't lose sight of two people that are pioneers that were the first to do that. Right. We don't have a Tiger Woods. We don't have a Calvin Pete. We don't have a Lee Elder without Charlie Sifford. By the same token, we don't have a Naomi Osaka. We don't have a Serena Venus Williams. We don't have a, a Madison. A Madison. We don't have those kind of players that aren't there without Althea Gibson, what she was able to do. And I hate the fact that the more and more we go away from them, they continue to be further and further Man. put into the bowels of history. It's crazy. Uh, and, that, and when you brought it up, I said, wow, that's, that's a name I haven't heard in a minute. But it's it's so true. So underrated. All right. Next one. And the last one on quick ones. And th- this is more of a top three. So I, I, I'm going to throw this one at you. Give me your top three foods. Oh, top three foods. Uh, that should be easy. Macaroni and cheese. Without question. It doesn't matter if my wife did this. <laughs> my mom, Maddie Coleman, makes it. I'm a big macaroni and cheese fan. That's number one. Number two, you give me like a nice, good pork chop. You know, it could be grilled. It could be fried. I'm good to go with that from that standpoint. And you got to give me, I'm going to have to put a dessert in the middle of this. You give me some caramel icing cake. It could be single layer, double layer. Okay, okay, okay. My Aunt Lucibel is the best one that's ever made it. She lives up in Springfield, Massachusetts, and my mom can make it as well. But my Aunt Lucibel, she's the queen of that. (laughs) She's the queen. (laughs) Yeah, you, you give me that. You give me those three. And say go away. I'm good for the rest of my life. 
Ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing wrong with that. All right, everybody. That has been the Freddie Coleman edition of Quick Ones here on One on Ones. And before we move on and before we end this bad boy, I want to give love to my man Freddie Coleman for coming on to One on Ones and and, and being a part of this. It was it was a, a truly an honor to to have you on because of you know what you and and so many others you know the Stuart Scotts and so on have meant to myself. Uh, growing, you know, as as a, as a sports journalist and, and trying to make this thing work for myself and, and my team. So we truly appreciate that. And um, just want to thank you for that. My pleasure, my friend. This one, I, I had to wait to episode 35, so I'm okay with that. So I'm hoping <laughs> I'll have to wait a little bit longer because I wouldn't mind coming back and being a part of this and chopping it up with you. Well, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, we, we'll have to get you back in here, maybe, maybe after the draft. I mean, because we, we might have to, we, we might have some things we got to talk about then to see how that Jets team is looking yeah. after the draft. You know, it might be something we have to look into. Yeah, we might have to do that, my friend. You got it. You let me know. <laughs> So before we leave, leave, Freddie, is there any um, thing, any special interest out there, anything that you got going on that you want to get out to the forefront? And what type of legacy do you want to leave uh, in the sports world? Boy, that's a great question, because I always tell people that it's easy to say live, laugh and love. And I think that we really have to put that in a prominent place more than ever before, because it can be very easy to, real, to have life just wear you down, whether it's pandemic related or whatever that is more than ever before mental health really has to be at the forefront of a lot of things. And I want people to live, laugh, and love as much as possible. Hug your loved ones a little bit closer. Let them know how much you mean to them, how much they mean to you. So that's definitely one thing from the standpoint more than ever before. I want people to really realize and recognize and not just treat it as a second, treat it as an afterthought. I don't want that to happen. Right. And number two, I guess I never thought about a legacy. I always tell people I'm glad I was never like that next big thing or that hot, whatever that is. I'm a big believer in longevity and credibility. And I think if you have both of those things, then you can go a long way. And you mentioned my friend, the late Stuart Scott. He was going to be himself. And that's the one thing I want people to realize about his legacy. He didn't do or say all those things just to impress you. That's who he was. That's He was that same person outside of the Sports Center Studios the same way he was in the Sports Center Studios. And it was always a treat to be around him because you knew you were getting somebody authentic and somebody that was going to be real. And he had that credibility and he had that longevity because he was not trying to be the second or third someone else. He was going to be the best first Stuart Scott that he could be. So if that's going to be anything with my legacy, no matter what people think about me, that credibility and longevity means a lot to me. I never worried about highs and lows because those things are going to be there. But as long as you're able to be the best you can possibly be, I can live with whatever people think about me, whether from a professional standpoint or from a personal standpoint. And it's amazing. And you can tell how genuine, how genuine he was because like you, it screamed through the television screen. It yep. screamed through it. And so, I mean, he's definitely one of my um, role models uh, in this industry. But another one right here in front of you, Mr. Freddie Coleman. Freddie, I truly, 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 truly appreciate you coming on on episode 35 of One on Ones here in season two of the uh, on the Legacy Maker Sports Network. Work. Freddie, man, you take care of yourself, man. And thank you for coming on. You too, my brother. God bless you, my friend. And continue great success as well, Darrell. One, 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 one. Welcome to the one on one, one on one. When it comes to ratings, man, we number one. We number one. I get the truth, truth. Then I give them the scoop. If anybody got a question, I give them the proof. Welcome to the one on one, the one on one. When it comes.